And the fundamental wealth was derived from three species in the genus Hevea, scattered across a rainforest the size of the face of a full moon. The trees were scattered as a biological adaptation to protect them from a pernicious fungal disease, the South American leaf blight, which always proves to be virulent if rubber is concentrated in plantations. That accident of biology determined the entire economics of the rubber trade. In order to get to the trees worth tapping, you had to mobilize huge amounts of labor. And when the 5,000 men pouring into the Amazon every week from the northeast of Brazil proved insufficient for the trade, the rubber barons had to turn to the Indian people. And now they had a problem. How to secure the yoke of the trade, indigenous people who were faced with adversity could simply flee into the forest they knew so well. So the rubber barons, of course, determined that the solution was terror. And a Capuchin priest that Schultes met on the Punta Mayo on that first trip said to him that the best thing that could be said about a white man in the Punta Mayo in the years of the rubber trade was that he did not kill his Indians for sport. And the atrocities that were unleashed were truly remarkable. Probably 40 to 50,000 indigenous people lost their lives. Others were scarred for life. All of this created this bonanza of wealth that did not finally end until the British took the seeds of the rubber tree in 1877 out of Brazil in specially equipped ships, specially equipped trains, and eventually sowed the seeds of what became the modern rubber industry in Southeast Asia. And when that happened, the reversal of fortune was incredible. In 1918, the, the, uh, in 1914, Brazil still produced over half the world's rubber supply. By 1918, the plantations produced 80% of it. In 1934, when automobile manufacturing surpassed a million units, Brazil had become a net importer of the products she had given the world. She produced only 1.3% of what had become a vital commodity for the industrial world. And that was the situation on December 8th of 1941, when Schultes heard about Pearl Harbor. Within six weeks of Pearl Harbor, the Japanese went into Malaysia. At that point in time, 97% of the world's rubber supply grew within 15 degrees longitude and latitude of Singapore, first place the Japanese went. Within six weeks of Pearl Harbor, they had taken control of the entire world's rubber supply. There was no synthetic substitute. In 1940, DuPont made 4,000 metric tons of a serviceable synthetic rubber useful only for batteries, not for tires. U.S., just U.S. domestic consumption of rubber in 1940 was 625,000 metric tons. Now the Allies were responsible for producing a million metric tons up to fuel the most important industrial expansion in history, the army of the Allies cause. It was an incredible crisis. Every Sherman tank had 20 tons of steel and half a ton of rubber. Every ship sunk by the Japanese at Pearl Harbor had 30,000 rubber parts. Every mile of wiring in every domestic and military installation in the entire free world was insulated by rubber cut from the tree. Roosevelt was told after the fall of France that the Allies in the United States had a six-month supply in the stockpile. He set in motion three incredible initiatives. The Allies only got through 1943 with the most massive recycling campaign in history. You could deposit rubber at 400,000 depots in the United States alone. Even Roosevelt's dog, Fala, had his toy bones melted down. The speed limit dropped in the Allied world to 35 miles an hour, not for want of petroleum, but to protect our 
Tigris. The Allies only got through 1943 by Reese, Lesson, Douglas. The second initiative was the order went, went out to the synthetic chemists to find a way to produce a million metric tons of synthetic rubber by 1944, or the war and civilization would be lost. This was at a time when the gross domestic product of the United States was less than $100 billion, and direct orders to industry from government the day the war broke out were over $100 billion. So there was a tremendous competition for material and for labor and for invention. The third initiative, which is central to this story, is that the plant explorers were sent out to every corner of the free world to drain every drop of latex from every tree you could find. We had Russian dandelions growing in 43 U.S. states and seven Canadian provinces as a source of latex. We sent plant explorers like Schultes in wartime circumstances back in the heart of the forest. His first mission was to go down a river that was mapped on charts of Columbia as 2,000 kilometers of a dotted unknown line. The real Apoporis, affluent of the Kakata, said to be the mother load of rubber. His mission was to go into the forest in these curious headwaters which were virtually unexplored, said to be the homeland of cannibals, the Karihona. His mission was to map the Apoporis, travel down to Hirihirimo, counting individual rubber trees to estimate what the potential was of this unknown river. He began his expeditions by going up the Valpes and dragging a three-ton boat over land two weeks through the forest just to get to the Apple Forest. He left in August. He was told, whatever you do, do not go through the cataract of Hirihirimo. Because if you do, there is nothing we can do for you. Well, Schultes was declared lost in November. His family was about to be notified. He had disappeared in the northwest Amazon of Colombia. Finally, at the end of December, somehow a message came back from the mission at La Pedrera that there was a very skinny, muy flaco, gringo, who said he was American but acted more British who was painting art church blue. It turns out that Schultes had not only discovered mountains that now bear his name, he had found so many plants. He used to say it broke his heart. He would walk through the forest covering his eyes with his hands just so he would not see yet another new species that he could not collect. His mission was very specific, count rubber trees, and that he did. 18,712 specimens of Hevia brasiliensis. He estimated that the Apoporus had two to three million trees. This was the mother load of rubber. He found a few new species that he stuck in his bags, including this one. And here's the photograph he took, approaching Hirihirimo, which of course now is a great national park and sacred to the Mapuna. And he went all the way through the cataract, vowing always and eventually to return the homeland of the Macuna, the Pila Paraná, the homeland of Barasana, Atuyo. He knew that this was where his heart would be. Meanwhile, of course, as he found his way back to Bogota, they discovered that the focus had changed. Even at the height of the rubber boom, when 5,000 adventurers a week were pouring into the Amazon, Brazil only produced 50,000 metric tons of rubber. We needed a million metric tons. So increasingly, by 1943, the order changed. Not to find raw sources of latex, though that was still important, but to find a way to break the Asian monopoly so that never again will be hostile to a foreign power outside of the Americas taking over rubber supply lines 13,000 kilometers away. Somewhere in the Amazon, where there were probably 300 million Kiwi Brazilians' trees, there had to be some rare ecotypes resistant to this terrible fungal disease.